Okay, in this first part of the video, we're going to talk about being slippery in defence. Now, some players are referred to as being tricky and slippery and difficult to beat. I remember reading about um, the game between Gary Kasparov and Vichy Anand when I was younger. I was like 1992, had BCM Chess Magazine. And um, they were talking about Linares tournament. They said that Kasparov, in this particular game, got very annoyed by the sort of trickiness of Vichy's defence. And that always stuck in my mind. You know, and I think around about that time, Anand was really like a hero of mine. Now, in most of this video, we're going to look at, like, games that are quite recent. We're not just going to talk about old classics, because I feel like, you know, to some extent, those games have been done to death in other videos. and You don't just want to look at, you know, just games that have been done before. But I think this game particularly stands out as an example of being slippery in defence. And... Just the tactical brain and tactical awareness of, of Viz Wonathan and Anne at that time was just incredible. And he was able to escape from the clutches of this monster, Kasparov, in this particular game. Obviously, that wasn't always the case because Kasparov had a very good ref against him. But yeah, I think this is a good example of being slippery in defence. So let's have a look at the game. Um, so Kasparov was white and he plays, and calls Kasparov all the way for his career turn it to alternate between e4 and d4 depending on the game and the opponent um, I think a lot of it was the periods some periods he would play e4 and some periods he would play d4 but I generally feel maybe it was more of an e4 player I'm not sure about that okay so now we get the winner with defense and Kasparov had a lot of success with this move h4 now, what is the idea? Why would you go h4? Because it looks like a really awful move. It looks like you're neglecting your development to a massive extent. You know, it looks like a silly move. Well, it, where it makes sense is it fits in with White's strategy. So White's gained the advantage of the two bishops. Um, but how does he then continue? Because Black's position is very, very solid. Well, one of the ideas is to play h4, h5 h6 and weaken black's dark squares even more black would then be uh, forced to go g6 or take the pawn and that would weaken his dark squares particularly the square f6 in fact this kind of occurs in the game now if black responds to that by playing h6 or h5 that's also some sort of concession so for example if he goes h6 then maybe later on white will play something like queen g4 and it becomes difficult to play g6 because then you'll create more weaknesses. So, the closed nature of the position allows White to play this plan. Um, Anand played knight b to c6, h5 was played, and now queen a5. But Black does have a choice here. He could indeed go for this h6 move. And after knight f3, queen a5, bishop d2, I think there's, there's a line that goes like this, bishop d2, bishop d7, Rook b1, and chances are roughly balanced. I think uh, sometimes a black queen can, all, can even drop back to c7. And in fact, there are lines where black doesn't bother to go queen a5. He simply goes queen c7. So there's a lot of theory in this. I think black is just about holding his own. But after, sorry, let's just go back to the position in the game. Uh, bishop d2 was played. Uh, black took on d4. But of course, that opens up the position for the two bishops. Now, you could play, you could consider a move, and I think this shows Kasparov's imagination, is that here he just gives up the pawn on d4. You could play a move like c3, but I think then black would just take, and if we take with a rook, uh, maybe even a move like knight a5 is a little bit annoying for white. So you always have to think, you know, yes, c3 looks good because then we've got the two bishops. But concretely, does it work? Because if black just goes here and starts dominating c4 square, then maybe we can't really generate anything with those two bishops. So Kasparov goes a much sharper way to play. He just gives up his pawn uh, with the move knight f3. Knight takes d4 and bishop d3. And I would say that this pawn sacrifice 
shows profound insight by Kasparov. He's a very good fan of dart squares. Sometimes to move rook h4, probably not in this position because it will drop the rook, but at some stage rook h4 might annoy black. Um, so very good conversation, almost like alpha zero insight really um, into the opening problems. Um, you know, we've seen recently in recent times, Alpha Zero is quite happy to sacrifice material, sacrifice pawns for the initiative. And Kasparov really had a trademark on that back in the 1980s and 1990s. So Knight EC6 was played. White just played a dinky little move, King F1. Happy to give up another pawn. Um, Knight takes F3, Queen takes F3. And funny enough, I looked this position up. And this was the early exam earliest example of this particular opening. So I think it shows that Kaspar really um, forged the way in a lot of opening theory. Um, you know, he was just so well prepared. He was ahead of his time. And I think here he understands that if black takes the pawn on e5, we're going to have some nastiness like queen g3 and, and maybe take on g7. So we already see that white's attack can be quite dangerous. So in the game, black played um, b6, very solid move. He could have played queen d4, which is another possible line, before taking the pawn. Because the idea is now the queen on d4 is defending g7. So, I mean, imagine before, if you go for the immediate knight takes e5, queen here, knight d3, maybe we don't take back immediately. Maybe we go queen g7 first, and black has a bit of a problem. Because if he goes rook f8, maybe we still leave the knight there and play a move like bishop h6, and you, you could be in trouble. Uh, because you're probably going to drop that rook. So, yeah, going back to this game, uh, if queen d4 instead of b6, then rook e1, queen g3, and c takes d3. With an unclear position, even though white is currently, what is he, two pawns down? It's quite a lot of material. He has a very dangerous, potentially dangerous attack on the dark squares. It's a trickful way to play. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for a tricky way to play where we're setting our opponent headaches in the opening. And this is why I like what Kasparov's done in the opening because he's set his opponent real you know, problems, real tricky problems to solve um, over the board. That's what you need to do in a chess game. You know, Forget about the computer evaluation. You're not playing with a computer during the game. Uh, well, if you are, you should be thrown out of chess, in my opinion. Um, and you probably will be, but yes, you're not, you don't have resource to the computer during the game. So effectively it's you against your opponent, you know, having to solve these problems over the board. It's not always easy. And it's well known, uh, for example, in positions where we have bishops of opposite color and it's still the middle game. Obviously in the end game, it's very drawish. In the middle game, it's well known that the player who has the initiative often has the advantage. And here, white clearly has the initiative. He's got leading development. Uh, yes, black is defending g7 for the time being, but it's not clear where he's going to put his king. If he tries to castle king's side, then moves like h6 are going to be very dangerous. And, of course, if he tries to castle queen's side, then rook is coming to c1. So, very interesting play. Black played b6. And the tricky move, h6. Very good move by Kasparov. And uh, if black was now to take, we leap in, rather than taking back the pawn, we leap in with queen f6, rook g8. And in fact, again, we'd be very tempted to take the pawns, but something even stronger. That's why I was thinking chess, just to give you a tip. Chess is all about options. Um, you must give yourself options. You must. Candidate moves are very important. We're talking about, generally in this video, we're talking about finding unusual moves. If you don't identify candidate moves, then if you don't if you don't look at more candidate moves, then you're not going to find these these unusual ideas. Here white could take on h7 or take on h6, but in fact if you look even deeper, you've got something even stronger, rook h4. Effectively trapping the black queen. 
he's pretty much got only one way to save it, which is by playing d4, but now this weakens this diagonal as well. Um, he can't play knight d4 because that knight's going to get pinned and probably one with a move like bishop e3 or bishop c3. So he plays d4, and after d4, we can now take uh, rook f8 and then bishop takes h6. So we kind of cut the queen off from doing anything active along along here, and now we're just we're just cashing in. We're threatening stuff like bishop takes f8. So very very strong. So that's why Vichy played bishop a6. These guys calculate on a very high level, so they understand a lot of this stuff. Um, very very resourceful move by Vichy. So White took on g7, rook g8. Now he has some choices. He could even defend the pawn with a move like queen g3. Again, it's not so clear what you should play here as white. He decided to take on a6. Queen takes a6, king g1. So this is a result of very good preparation by Kasparov. He's got an advantage. Um, when I chatted to Mark Adams about Kasparov, it was very interesting. He said, you know, Kasparov is very strong because not only was his preparation very good, but even if you survived the preparation, he, he could still outplay you and still beat you because he was very strong in the middle game as well. So this is a particular problem that um, Anand is faced with, that uh, his preparation has gone a bit wrong. But now he has to defend very well, and he does. And he, he plays absolutely the right move. Eliminate that very strong pawn, rook plays g7. Queen f6 was played, rook g8, rook takes h7, and queen b7. So again, we, 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 you know, this is a difficult situation for white because he has a choice. Um, I think a lot of players might be tempted to cash in here and, and play a move, which I think is a mistake, like queen takes. I mean, I'll just, just let you know that in the game we went bishop g5. But yeah, some some players might be tempted to cash in. I think this would be a mistake. I think this would let black off the hook because after you take rook takes b7, uh, knight takes e5. I think black is probably okay here. Um, again, the material was that equal. We can't play rook e1 because of knight f3 check. Maybe this was a possibility for white and trying to outplay him in, in in the end game. But I think that would be giving up your advantage too easily. Um, but there was actually a superior alternative, possibly to bishop g5, which was played a move c4. So the idea, main idea, I don't think this is obvious, to be honest. I think um, I think the main reason you you sort of like you know wouldn't play c4 is because you think, well, hang on, the rook on g8 when he takes on c4 uh, isn't you know isn't that line being open up and suddenly the queen is now open on this diagonal so it doesn't really make much sense you know i'm going to run into stuff like knight d4 so a lot of players will dismiss it out of hand but if you think about it concretely after the move bishop d5 um white is doing very very well and now importantly because we're taking on c4 after move knight d4 we have rook d1 and the d file is open and black is essentially in big, big trouble, apparently. This is, so c4 is a very nice move, just open up a second front. Another defensive idea for black is the move d4. And then we go bishop g5, queen e7, and now a nice little trick, queen f3, just to emphasize our advantage. And, um, if we take on g5, then c6 is dropping, and probably the rook's going to drop as well. So, for example, let's just show you that. Well, in fact, after here, we have queen takes f7, and then mate on d7. And if you go for something like queen d7, maybe I could even think about taking on f7 here. Did I think about that? Yes, possibly. Although, then you have knight takes e5. Um... Yeah, because I was thinking here we have check and then we're winning because we're going to take this guy with check. But you have knight takes e5, not so clear maybe. Rook d7, knight f3, and then take on g5, take on d7. We're actually losing. Uh, so, but actually, can I go? Maybe I could go rook e7, improve this variation. Rook e7, 
uh, queen e7 and then queen takes a8. Yes. King here and then we take it. It's all the tactics are working for white, mainly because the black king is so open and exposed. So, yeah, I think that would essentially be winning. Uh, so c4 was already a, almost a forced win for Kasparov, just opening up the position even more. But he played bishop g5 in the game, uh, which is also quite strong. And now I like the, what, what Vichy does. So he kind of, even though he's got very little resources to fight with, he can't castle queen's side. Um, his rook on a8 isn't really working. But somehow he finds this very tricky way to play. And he starts with this move, knight d4. This is why I like this game, you know, just suddenly finding these tricks. And the knight in particular in chess is a very, very tricky piece. It's very easy to overlook knight moves. And suddenly the knight starts jumping around. So I think Vichy is noted for his play with the knights. I think even Kramnik said this, that Vichy is known for very, very strong play with his knights. Very, very tricky to keep a lid on his counterplay. So knight d4 is a very good move. Now Kasparov decided to go for this c4 idea, but it's slightly different now because black played knight check, king h2, a very nice move, knight c3. So he's got two ideas. One is to take on c4 and go knight d5 and defend that way. And the other way is just to simply go knight e4, hitting the queen and the bishop. So already I'd imagine that Kasparov was probably tearing his hair out at this point. He was probably thinking, you know, knight c3, how on earth have I allowed all this counterplay? But he's still in control. Um, so if he goes f3, then we can we can take on c4. That's not a problem for black. But he goes rook h8. It's a very good move. Very direct move. Rook takes, queen takes, king d7. So this was like the high point of the game. And here Kasparov could have won. <clears throat> and he, I think he talked about this afterwards. He could have won with a move queen f6. Uh, which is threatened to take on... <coughs> on f7 so we don't really want to go back because that allows white all the time in the world to activate his rook so we go uh king c6 and this may be the line that kasparov was afraid of because you're thinking well the king is suddenly looking quite safe now we, we carry on the variation so c takes knight takes rook c1 king b5 and now very good move queen f3 Threatening to come round to d3 and expose the black king. King a6, we do this anyway. Queen d3, b5, and now this move. Very nice move at the end. a4. And effectively, I think black is probably winning here. Um, not an easy line to find over the board. Kasparov, you know, one of the greatest players of all time, if not the greatest. Uh, and certainly a fantastic tactician and calculator wasn't able to find it. I think he was getting short of time. He played instead Queen H7, which also looks very tempting and also better for white. But after Black's good defense, Rook F8, he failed to take advantage. And I think now Black is just about okay. Rook E8, Queen takes, Rook E7, Queen B8. So again, good, very good slippery defense by um, Vichy. So he's threatening to take on e5. He can also bring the queen round sometimes to h8 and annoy the uh, black, the white pieces on the uh, king side. Uh, so white decided to take. Now, again here, I think because Kasparov was a little bit upset by the very good nature of black's defensive play, he plays another mistake. This is often what you'll find. You know, if you if you defend stubbornly, you might look at that position, you might think, oh, you know, this is terrible. I'm never going to save this game. You know, you'll get games like that. But if you just defend very well, you'll be you'll be amazed in the number of times your opponent will, will make mistakes. And sometimes if you just keep the game within the boundaries of not completely losing, but actually worse, but not completely losing, then... You'll be amazed at the number of games you turn around. I think this is a typical example. Here White starts to waver. He could play the move rookie one. He's still better. But Black has much better defensive chances, for example. Now maybe you can think about bringing the king to b7 where it's quite safe. Um, rookie one was still better for White. But instead he, he makes a further mistake. He, he plays rook d1. Queen takes e5. 
f4, and now again another nice defensive move, maybe overlooked by Kaspar. Queen h8, very easy to overlook these retreating moves. f5, queen e5, and Kasparov decided this was time to pull the escape hatch, and he played king h1. And he offered a draw, which was accepted. So, so Anand could well have played on here. And he's, he's certainly over the worst. And I think psychologically he would have had the advantage as well because he, but obviously he felt that a draw with Kasparov with Black was a good result, particularly from the position they had. So understandably, I think objectively this position is, is a draw with best play. But given that White is the one currently making mistakes, I think if they'd have played on, who knows what, what would have happened. But yes, very interesting defensive play by Anand. And it just goes to show that even in a position where it doesn't look like you've got much play, it looked like he was only playing with his queen and knight. He was still able to create this amazing slippery defense. So that's the first part of the video covered, slippery defense.